little harm to divert some of them. And stars Marilyn Chambers, an American sex queen who boasts of being as insatiable in real life as her character is in the movie. Apparently, she gives nude radio and television interviews in the States. She could not, unfortunately, be with us in the studio tonight, but anyone who sees the film will find they get to know her body fairly well. Precious little is left to the imagination. The film's distributors make no secret of their delight and surprise at getting Insatiable past the censor and are confidently expecting to clean up all over the country. In fact, two or three minutes of the film were cut before it could be given an X certificate. James Furman, the secretary of the British Board of Film Censors, explained to me that the bulk of it was allowed to go by because it merely showed adults making love to each other in a number of different ways, rather than featuring anything illegal or harmful. The question at issue is the degree to which private acts should be shown on the public screen before they exceed the bounds of public acceptability. He looks forward to a more clear-cut situation in which all pornographic films designed simply to titillate an audience are shown under licensed conditions. In the meantime, I must agree with him that we have little to fear from Insatiable, which is unlikely to corrupt or deprave anybody. Well, it sounds like you've had yourself quite an afternoon. Oh, Flo. <sighs> it feels so good to have great sex. Sandra, you remind me so much of your mother. You have her beauty and spirit, but most of all, you have her passionate nature. <laughs> you don't know how passionate I am. I mean, when I say I love sex, I really love it. I get so excited when I make love, my body just tingles all over. I knew your desires were strong, but they sound stronger than I imagined. Flo, if I tell you something, do you promise to keep it a total secret? Whatever we discuss will be kept between us. I want to tell you about the first time I made love. It was around six years ago. After that brief burst of dialogue, the sim film is simply a continuous sequence of sexual activity, interrupted illogically from time to time by a second-rate travelogue, as Marilyn, playing the world-famous model Sandra Chase, is escorted around London by her Aunt Victoria, reminiscing the while about her fun times back home in L.A. Aunt Victoria, however, remains unaware of her niece's one great complaint. If only, muses Sandra, she knew how much I need someone who could keep up with my sexual appetites. Well, if insatiable is anything to go by, I fear that she'll have a hard time. The film begins with masturbation, troilism, and a climax, and that's before the credits have rolled. However, Insatiable is hardly the only softcore film on the open market. At the moment, there are about 35 sex films showing in ordinary London cinemas, and many more around the country. Anyone who fears that this might shock the older generation might be interested, or even appalled, to know that many pornographic cinemas now offer half-price reductions to old-age pensioners. And now back to Tina. Well, after all that bump and grind, let's take a look at a film for all the family. Dragon Slayer, the latest in the sword and sorcery sagas, is set in Britain in the Dark Ages after Caesar took his Romans home and before Christianity arrived. You can tell it's the Dark Ages because everyone says good morrow instead of hello, and the bad guys wear bouffant wigs. The wild and mountainous land with a Wagner opera blasting from every semi-detached cave is being terrorized by Vermithrax pejorative. That's not the tax man, but the name of the vengeful dragon who's the star of the film. And what a star he is. All dragons traditionally have paint-stripping halitosis, but this one sets whole lakes alight. It's 16 foot long, part alligator, part pterodactyl, part Boeing 747, and its fiery breath comes from two flamethrowers where its Adam's apple ought to be. Unfortunately, the dragon has a taste for country virgins, so the local king, drolly played by Peter Eyre, has devised a lottery and fixed it to keep his own daughter out. The villagers travel many miles, or rather many leagues, to persuade the top sorcerer, Ulrich, alias Ralph Richardson, to assist them in killing the dragon and saving their virgins from this bent bingo game. But Ulrich, not to be confused with Horserich, the courtier, is slain and has to be replaced by his young apprentice, Peter McNichol, a bronzed piece of Malibu beefcake. It's he who finally sets out to beard the dragon in its mountain lair. At last, as soon as this fabulous dragon takes center stage, the film hots up and my only real criticism is that we had to wade through all that horse rich earlier. Of course, there's a healthy allegory in it all. The dragon is the last relic of pagan belief, and the young sorcerer's faltering magic a symbol that superstition is dying out with the coming of Christ. Here we see top sorcerer Ralph Richardson's magical powers being tested. Dragon Slayer is now on in London, and will go out on release shortly. And that brings us to the end of another programme. David and I will be back next week at 10.40. So until then, good night.